Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. It is with joy that I welcome you to worship on this Sunday, August 2nd, the 18th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Whether you're watching us on a Sunday or in the evening or during the week, we are glad to have you in worship with us here at First Presbyterian Church, East Moline. As we gather this day, I invite you to join in our call to worship that you will find in the bulletins that were sent to you. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah 55. Anyone who thirsts, come and drink. If you have no money, but you are hungry, come and receive wine and milk without a price tag. Why do you spend money for that which does not nourish you? Why do you work for what does not nur nurture you? Listen, come and eat healthy food that will delight you. Come and partake in the spirit that will give you life. Become a witness of God's free gift of grace to all people. They will come running to you because our covenant God will raise you up, transform you, and make you shine. Let us worship God. Please be called to confession with these words. The promise of our faith is this. For all who call out in truth, God is near. Therefore, let us honestly confess our sin. God of justice and mercy, we admit that we are not always free of deceit. We are fooled by the false promises of the world into pursuing things that do not truly nourish us. Hear our cry and save us, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, let us enter into a time of silence as we individually confess our sins before God. Amen. Here is good news for everyone. God is gracious, merciful, abounding in steadfast love, and gives us forgiveness and grace. We do not have to earn it with sacrifice because it is a free gift from our generous God. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen.
As we prepare to hear God's word, will you pray with me the prayer of illumination? Lord, by the power of your spirit, give us your words of life, that our faith may increase and our hearts be made whole. Amen. This morning's Old Testament lesson is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. Listen for the word of God. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life was preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. The word of the Lord. Amen. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter, reading verses 13 to 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit and fill this sanctuary and our homes and our lives with your love. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For truly you are our strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week, I spent time with the story of the feeding of the 5,000 
And even though I thought it was a story I knew really well after all these years, I realized there were things I had never really heard before in this story. It reminded me of the importance of reading with new ears and seeing new eyes when we come back to familiar passages from the Bible. It also reminded me of a story that I hadn't thought of in years that comes from the first church that I served in suburban Detroit. Many years ago, when Daniel, who is now somewhere in his 30s, I would guess, was in kindergarten and lived in Detroit, his mother called me one Saturday to tell me about what had happened to them. She and Daniel were walking, walking into the Handy Andy hardware store there in their neighborhood. And just before going into the store, Daniel stopped his mom and he pointed across the parking lot. And there was a man from India in a long white robe and a gold turban. And ja Daniel leaned into his mom and said to her in hushed tones, Mom, it's Jesus. And Sue turned to him and said, no, Daniel, that's a man who comes from India, and that's how some people in India dress. And Daniel would not be convinced that this was the truth because that was Jesus. And so as they went through the rest of the Handy Andy hardware store, Daniel was bouncing with excitement that Jesus was visiting his neighborhood. And then Sue was reading a can of paint, reading ingredients, and Daniel was at her side, still talking away, and then all of a sudden he got quiet. And then he reached up and he grabbed, his, grabbed Sue's arm and he said, Mom, it's a staple. And she said, Dan Daniel, what's a staple? And he pointed to a woman in their aisle, also from India, wearing a sari, and he said, that's a staple. And, and Sue said, Daniel, what's a staple? And, and he said, well, it's a person that helps Jesus, Mom. And she said, Daniel, do you mean a disciple? And he said, yes, a staple. That's a staple. And all the way home, Daniel was bouncing with excitement because Jesus and a staple had come to visit him in his neighborhood that day. I'm glad this story reminded me of that story because it, it is a favorite of mine. And what I'm going to ask you to do today is to see Jesus and the staples or the disciples with new eyes, to see them in our neighborhoods and in our lives in new ways. And the first way I'm going to do that is invite you to join me in renaming this story. You may have noticed at the end of the reading, as Matthew is telling this story, he says, and 5,000 men were fed besides the women and children. So one of the ways that maybe we can see this story with new eyes is to realize that with the women and children, maybe about 20,000 people were fed that day there on that hillside above the Sea of Galilee then we're probably closer to the real numbers and the real miracle of this story. We're also hearing a story that was very important for those who came after Jesus in those first centuries because it's included in all four of the Gospels. Everyone, all the four Gospel writers wanted to make sure that we knew this story. But since we are hopefully past the days of besides women and children, I think it's important for us to maybe begin to call this the feeding of the 20,000 and be closer to the big miracle that this time was. As I spent time with the story this week, it's the first time that I've really paid attention to when the feeding of the 20,000 took place. Now, I've told you many times through the years in sermons when I've talked about parables of Jesus or have told stories of Jesus 
that it's important for us to look at what's happening around the story. What are the, the verses and the stories before and after the story we're looking at? And clearly, I didn't follow my own advice when I read this story or when I've preached on it in the past because I'd never noticed before what happened around the story. Right before this happens, Jesus is with his disciples and they receive the heartbreaking news that John the Baptist has been murdered by Herod. Herod, who was the ruler of that region, and this took place at Herod's birthday party. You may remember that Herod had taken and married his brother's wife, and John the Baptist had something to say about this, and he said it often to the point that Herod got tired of hearing that his choice was outside of God's realm, and so he imprisoned John, John the Baptist, to silence him. He really wanted to have John the Baptist killed, but he was too nervous to do that because John had such a big following. There were crowds who came to hear him preach beside the Jordan River. And so Herod kept him in prison, but kept him alive. But on that fateful night of Herod's birthday party, his stepdaughter danced for the gathering that was there for that birthday party. And Herod liked it so much that he promised her anything she asked for would be hers. And so she went to her mother Herodias, Herod's wife, to ask for her guidance. And of course, Herodias didn't want to hear anything more from John the Baptist either, and so she had her daughter ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And her daughter's wish was granted. And so it's this horrific, devastating story that Jesus and the disciples heard on that day. And understandably, Jesus wanted to be alone. This was his cousin John. This was the son of his aunt and his uncle, of Elizabeth and Zechariah. This was the man who had baptized him in the Jordan River, this was the man that scripture said was the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. This was a person close to Jesus' heart, and he had been brutally murdered. So Jesus takes one of the fishing boats, and he goes across the Sea of Galilee to be alone in a deserted place. I want you to take a moment and imagine a time in your own life when you have gotten the news of the death of a beloved family member or of a friend. There is that initial just searing, hollowed out feeling that comes over you. There's that sorrow that doesn't really have words. And there's that near inability to take in and believe what you are hearing. And these may have been some of the things that Jesus was feeling as he got into that boat and headed across the sea to the deserted place. It's this moment of great sorrow and the horror of John's death, the horrible way he was murdered, that begins the story of the feeding of the 20,000. Jesus' cousin John is dead. And so Jesus is going by boat to a deserted place. Now, as you listen to this story and you think about the Sea of Galilee, I don't want you to be imagining an ocean. It's more helpful to imagine a really large inland lake. At its widest, the Sea of Galilee is just eight miles across, so it is easy to see from one side to the other of the Sea of Galilee. And at this point, Jesus was up at the north end of the sea. So as he left the crowds, went to be alone, got into a boat, the boat would have passed by other small villages there along the Sea of Galilee. And the, la the large crowds who followed him would have been able to watch where the sail of his boat was going and actually see where his boat was going to the other side at the top of the Sea of Galilee or that large 
inland lake. So that by the time that Jesus beaches his boat on the other side of the sea, the large crowd is already there. They've walked around the top of the lake and they're there waiting for him as he gets out of the boat. And in the midst of his sorrow and his loss and his longing for some alone time, Jesus looks out at this large crowd that is gathered. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have wanted to immediately get back into the boat and begin to row as fast as I could to get away from that. But Jesus looked at the crowd, and Matthew says that he had compassion for them, and he cured their sick. This word compassion in the New Testament, in New Testament Greek, is a wonderful word because it means not just as we think of compassion in English, but it's, it's a deeper word. It means to feel something in your guts, to feel it deeply, to feel it viscerally. In Greek, the word even sounds like what it means. Splognizomai is the word. Jesus splognizomai for the crowd. He felt a gut level compassion and love and care for them as he looked at them. As one of my seminary professors used to say, Jesus felt it in his gizzard. She was from Arkansas. That was how she talked. His gizzard. He had a gut deep, visceral compassion for those 20,000 people that had walked around the lake to be with him. And so in the midst of his grief, he turned to the crowd and he healed their sick family and friends that they had brought with them to be with him. And it says that he did that all day until late in the day. And by then, the disciples have either come by boat or have also walked around the lake and they now see this place where Jesus is with 20,000 people in it. This deserted place is now filled up. And I realized this week in reading other authors that we need to remember that the disciples were grieving too. They too had lost someone important to them. They too had lost John, who many of them had probably heard preaching there along the Jordan River. John, whom they'd seen baptizing people there along the Jordan. They knew who he was to Jesus. They knew and had lost someone they cared about deeply too. And so when they saw this crowd, this now hungry crowd at the end of a day, they wanted them to go away. Probably so this could be a deserted place for them too. And so they say to Jesus, why don't you send the crowd away? Let them go into the little towns nearby and they can buy food for themselves and they can eat and they can leave. But Jesus says to the disciples, the crowd doesn't have to go away. You give them something to eat. Take a moment and let yourself imagine being a tired, grieving probably also hungry, disciple, surrounded by 20,000 hungry people, and hearing Jesus say to you, you give them something to eat. In the Greek, it's clear that, that Jesus is saying this emphatically to them. You, you do it. You feed the people. You give them something to eat. But all the disciples have is five loaves of bread and two fish, which were probably small dried fish that many people carried with them when they traveled so that they would have protein to eat. They had a little bit of food, really not even enough for the 12 of them, definitely not enough for 20,000 people. So Jesus takes the bread and the fish from them and he orders the crowd to be seated on the grass there on the hillside going up from the Sea of Galilee. 
And then the Bible says that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And then Jesus turned to the disciples and said, you give them the food. Jesus used just what the disciples had, and it was enough. In fact, it was more than enough. Twelve baskets full, more than enough. And I realized this week we always talk about the feeding of the 5,000, now the feeding of the 20,000 as Jesus feeding them, but really it's Jesus and the disciples feeding the 20,000. What would you have felt like if you were one of those 12 carrying around a basket, picking up the abundance of the leftovers as you walked between 20,000 people? What would the growing weight of that basket you were carrying have meant to you? In the midst of his own grief, Jesus healed. And Jesus, using the disciples and what they brought, fed the crowd. He changed the lives of those 12 disciples that day, and he changes our lives, us disciples, here in the present day. Because Jesus shows us the face of God's love that will go to any depths to bring healing and to bring nourishment to the children of God. And Jesus also showed the disciples then, but shows us here today that we are needed too. With whatever little it is that we bring with us, even if it's something as small as five loaves of bread and two fish, God can use us to care for God's people too. In fact, Jesus asks that of us, as he did of those disciples long ago. You, you do this. And using us and the small things that we bring with us, Jesus can love and feed and care in great Abundance. So here today, as we enter our fifth month of living with a world pandemic, as we continue to live with both completely necessary and completely unnecessary unrest in our nation's cities and towns, as the November elections draw ever closer, how can we not feel overwhelmed by what is happening in our world today? Into the great emotions of these days, and having listened to friends and some of you, I would say into the great 20,000 emotions of these days, it is easy to feel overwhelmed. It's easy to wonder what's going to happen next. It's easy to feel scared and anxious about what's going to happen to us and to those we love. How are we and our family and our country and our world and our church going to live through these days and survive these days? The story of the feeding of the 20,000 is a gift for us this morning. It shows us that even when the situation seems impossible, insurmountable, filled with grief and sickness and hunger, Jesus is present. Jesus shows up in each of our neighborhoods and in the neighborhoods of the world. Jesus shows up when we don't know what to do. Jesus shows up when the situation in our world overwhelms us. And Jesus comes to us with gut-deep compassion for each one of us and for our world. 
Jesus comes to us with healing for us. And Jesus asks us who follow him to be staples, to be disciples, who bring whatever little we have with us to help care for the world. Because what we've seen today on that hillside in Galilee so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago is still true today. Jesus has an extravagant abundance of love for everyone. And when we listen to him and we follow him, when we bring ourselves and the little that we have together, we can help give that abundant love away. And there will always be more than enough for everyone because we are promised that that is the way of God's ever-present, always giving, extravagantly abundant love. Amen. I would like to remind you in our announcements this morning that we long to get your prayer requests so we can send them out to the church. As you look at the bulletins you've been sent, I invite you to see there the lists of people who have asked for prayers and that need to be in our prayers these days. A reminder that today and each Sunday at 11 o'clock, we gather by Zoom to be together on Communion Sundays, we share communion together in real time. We also share our joys and concerns and pray together. And then there is fellowship time where we check in with everyone. We've had, gosh, 20 to 25 people join us by Zoom each week. And on Fridays, you will be mailed each week the invitation to those Zoom meetings. We also started, it's, this was our third week of having the sanctuary open on Wednesdays for those that would like to come and be in silence and in prayer. This week we had three people come. On Wednesdays, the sanctuary is open from 3 to 7 p.m. And anyone, whether you are part of our church or watching this service on YouTube and want to come and have a place for silent prayer, you are welcome to come in the doors on 25th Avenue and into the sanctuary. Please remember that parish nurse Laura Brown and I are at the end of the phone anytime if you need to talk, if you need someone to pray with you, and especially if you have joys or concerns you would like included in our prayers. Trusting in the presence of the living God, 
Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Spirit of the living God, we stand in awe of the mystery of your love that meets us wherever we are, that holds us, that comforts us, that challenges us, that heals us, that brings us peace when it seems that there is no peace. We thank you for the mystery of your love that connects us one to another in this communion meal that we are about to receive and in our hearts and lives day by day, breath by breath. We give you thanks and praise for your love that names each of us and claims each of us as sons and daughters of the living God. Gracious God, we entrust to your care this day all those listed in our bulletins and all those we carry in our hearts. We pray for those known to us and known to you who are living now with COVID-19. We continue to pray for medical teams here and around the world as they seek to bring good care to those who are struggling with this world pandemic. We ask that your peace and your protection would encircle them. We pray this day for those who in isolation have been put into danger because home is not safe, because relationships are not safe. And we ask that there would be people with eyes to see and voices to speak for those without a voice. We pray for those who walk the courageous journey of recovery, who have lost their support groups and have lost the ability to meet together to have support on the journey. And we ask that you bless them this day and in the days ahead. Holy God, we thank you that your love is bigger than a pandemic, bigger than unrest, more just than we can even imagine, and that it is that love that is shaping our lives so that we will be your hands and your feet and your voice of justice and of peace and of extravagant love. Prepare our hearts now to receive this communion meal as we pray together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Notre Père qui est aux cieux, que ton nom soit sanctifié, que ton règne vienne, que ta volonté soit faite sur la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain de ce jour. Pardonne-nous nos offenses comme nous pardonnons aussi à ceux qui nous ont offensés. Et ne nous soumets pas à la tentation, mais délivre-nous du mal, car c'est à toi qu'appartiennent le règne, la puissance et la gloire pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. Jesus takes bread and he gives thanks and he breaks it and he gives it to us. At this table, the broken, strong love of Christ is for us. And we are invited by name to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. We're invited to come and take, trust the mystery 
that in this meal we are connected to each other. Even though these pews are empty, that doesn't stop our God who connects our hearts through YouTube and through Zoom and through love here and around the globe. We are connected to the children of God. Here and in heaven, we are connected to the children of God. So let us trust in the joy and the gift of this meal. The table is ready, and it has been set by you, for you, and has been set for you, and you are invited by name to come to the table of the Lord. As we gather here together, I invite you to join in the great prayer. Let us remember how Christ has made our communion together possible. On the night when he was betrayed, I'm going to grab the other microphone because this one is not working. <laughs> and then we will continue, in, and its battery is low too, so we'll see how this goes. He came to be like us, that we might be more like him. He took bread. He came to share our life, that we might come to share in the very life of God. And when he had given thanks, we come to see the real Christ in the meal, his forgetfulness of self as against our self-centeredness, his humility against our foolish pride, his trust against our fears and doubts. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. Because God loved us so much, God gave Jesus, the only Son of God. He said, Take and eat, for this is my body. And with this bread, take forgiveness of each other as the very miracle itself. It is a gift. Do this in remembrance of me. We shall not be left desolate. He will come to us. Because he lives, we will live also. After dinner, he took the cup. The cup he drinks, we will drink. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you. For he now calls us his brothers and sisters. It is shed for you and for many. So don't judge unless you want to be judged. God is love and God's love redeems and frees for the forgiveness of sins. We know that the result of sin is separation from God, but God gives us the gift of life for all time with Christ, and in this life is unity with God. Whenever you drink this cup, remember me. These elements are brought by members of this family so that we might remember. Holy Spirit, Fill these elements with your spirit, so that through them we may enjoy the gift of life and unity with you. Find at this table peace and joy. Take not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Eat because you want to draw close to your brothers and sisters in love and communion. Receive because Christ is here at his table and offers you joy and peace in life and in the life to come. Alleluia. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the bread of heaven. Take and eat, all of you.
the same manner after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is a cup of a new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again in glory. This is the cup of our salvation. Drink deeply, all of you. Let us pray. In the end, as in the beginning, God is God, loved by us, wanted by us, praised by us, served by us, filling us with the gifts of the Spirit, making us whole for the good of the earth, for bread and cup, this place and this time, thanks be to God, for the peace we are promised which the world won't destroy, thanks be to God. For the hope of heaven on earth and the final song of joy, thanks be to God. Amen. And now as we go from this time of worship, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May our God look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Amen.